So in the in the area of nanophotonics, you know, typical nanophotonic design problem involves you know designing some kind of structure to confine light, okay, to confine electromagnetic waves, or to uh, couple waves from one region to another to trap light, to use light to impart optical forces on, on objects, um, or as a means of communication. And sort of the typical question is how do we enhance these kinds of functionalities through nanostructuring? And if you see down here, the kinds of structures that, that uh, you know, over the last uh, decade or so people have been interested in designing are um, sort of non-intuitive, uh, complex, you know, highly sort of multi-scale uh, devices that uh, were designed using computer algorithms. So these are these are structures that were designed using inverse methods. Um, just to give you an example, this sort of structure that you see here on the left is a is a nano cavity that takes a quantum emitter below uh, the structure. So in the substrate, in particular, an NV uh, defect. And then basically um, funnels, you know, enhances the radiation from the defect and funnels or channels that energy upwards. So it's a kind of near field lens um, and sort of it has some of the best properties of any kind of sort of optical on chip nano lens that, uh, that uh, people have seen. And so the idea behind uh, these techniques, of course, is sort of traditional design involves, you know, some. Uh, principle or guiding principle that, that allows you to formulate an understanding of the physics of a problem where you use a few high symmetry parameters to try and, and, and create the device. For example, how to design a band gap um, to, for you to trap light. Um, large scale optimization methods or inverse design instead, you know, the idea is you search through thousands of parameters uh, you know, and, and thousands of structures in sort of a blind search for better performance. And there's been sort of a, a buildup of use uh, of these techniques. Of course, you can are not uh, new. You know, people have been using inverse methods to design all kinds of of wave systems. You know, even in aerodynamical uh, design. You know, but, but the boy, the tip of the Boeing, uh, you know, new Boeing uh, wings are designed using inverse methods. But in ENM, you you really start seeing sort of a development of an, an application of these techniques toward you know the last decade or so. Um, and so you can see an example, sort of the, the, the uh, increasingly more complicated and, and sort of experimental uh, realization of these systems. Uh, and there's tons of applications, you know, ranging from information processing, um, how to slow down light, creating better solar absorbers uh, or cloaking light, um, uh, communication, uh, heat transfer. I'll talk about a few of these later on, where these inverse methods have have sort of converged on structures that do significantly better, you know, even orders of magnitude better performance than their intuitive counterparts. Um, and so I'll give you an example just to, to sort of ground the discussion of a popular, it's not unique, but a popular flavor of inverse design known as topology optimization or, or density optimization. And the idea there is you have a, given a computational domain where you want to design a device, you want to, a, you know, and, and this is an, just one example, you have a, a finite difference grid um, where you're discretizing Maxwell's equations or whatever PD you're interested in. And the basic relaxation behind this method is you assume that every pixel, right, every voxel in that computational cell is a continuous degree of freedom where the permittivity or the susceptibility, or if you're talking about quantum mechanics, you know, the potential can vary within some range, right, for every pixel. And you're solving some, uh, you know, maximization or minimization problem where you have a function, right, uh, typically a quadratic or a linear function of the fields. Um, quadratic because, you know, most, uh, device uh, objectives involve maximizing the energy in some region or the power flow or, or uh, uh, the number of channels of communication. And so these are all quadratic or sesquilinear objectives um, that are functions of the field, uh, the solutions of some, of some uh, initial value problem uh, given some permittivity and you wanna maximize or minimize the, uh, uh, the set objective with respect to all possible uh, configurations of the permittivity. Given the constraint, of course, that the field has to satisfy Maxwell's equations, okay, or your PDE. Um, 
And so it's, it's you, you have to base, basically enforce a relationship between the incident field or the current uh, free current that's, that's uh, um, sort of your initial uh, field and then the output field. And sort of the key to making this is sort of standard to making these problems tractable, you know, you, in principle, you can have thousands to millions of, of degrees of freedom and variations in the structure is to use adjoint methods, right? To, to be able to compute the gradients of the objectives of these quadratic objectives uh, with respect to the permittivities efficiently. And there's, there are sort of ways to do this and, and many different kinds of, of algorithms that, um, that you can apply to, to sort of try and find, you know, the uh, optimal for performance. And here's, by the way, an example of the kind of structure you get um, applying these methods. Uh, you'll notice that the, the structures, even though the permittivities are, are sort of taken, the main material relaxation is that they're taken within some range. So you're allowing variations of the permittivity in some range. At the end of the day, the structures that, that uh, we are interested in are binary structures, right? Because you, typically you have you know, a material that you're etching or you're, you're, you're uh, um, doing something to it to, to have variations between vacuum or air and the material. And so black here is the, the medium and white is sort of the you know, vacuum regions. And the way to sort of arrive at structures like this is to apply what are known as, as uh, regularization or filter, fil filtering techniques that sort of um, pin the permittivity to just a specific value once the optimization is, is nearly finished. And I won't get into the sort of specific de details of inverse design, but I just wanted you to get an idea of what, what's involved. Um, and sort of because we've had sort of these, these sort of techniques and there are sophisticated methods now to make realizable structures, um, you know, one uh, question that really uh, pops out is, well, how do you know that these structures, uh, and by the way, here's a few of the examples of, of novel structures, how do we know that, that these structures perform to the best of their ability, that, that we're really sort of probing the, the uh, limits of physical design? And the answer is we don't because the problem is, is effectively a uh, non-convex optimization problem. So you, there's no way to guarantee that you're getting a global optimum. The relationship between, uh, turn back, between the, the field and the permittivities is highly nonlinear, right? So you have to invert this, this operator. Uh, and that means you have no a priori you know, guarantees of opt uh, optimality. Uh, and so you know, we've been sort of you know, interested in, in, in figuring out to what degree these structures are optimal? Or how do we bound the performance? And so that's sort of the, the topic of this talk. Um, and just to give you a 20,000 feet uh, view of, of, of where we've converged, is it turns out you can um, turn the standard problem of, of doing structural optimization into a different kind of optimization problem where you're optimizing with respect to fields um, subject to select, selective constraints. And this problem, it turns out it's effectively a bound optimization problem. So it allows you to, to um, put constraints on what is feasible, what's possible. Um, and from a sort of numerical perspective, a programmatic pr perspective, it turns out the problems you're solving are a set of quadratic programs with, with convex relaxations. And, and so I'll, I'll give you a, an idea of what's, what's under the hood. Um, if there are any questions, by the way, at any point, please feel free to, to interrupt. Okay. Uh, I'll sort of so talk I, I about have a question on the on the mathematical structure over constraint. So in your first example, it was Maxwell's equation, which yes, kind of linear. So well, Maxwell's equations are linear uh, with respect to the fields, but they're nonlinear with respect to the permittivity. Right, you're inverting this operator. So that's th those are your structural degrees of freedom, so right? Inverting, okay, the inverse is the inverse. Yeah. Right. Sorry, I, I can't hear very well, so was that clear? Yeah, yeah, that's clear. Okay. Can't yeah, so my, very nonlinear problem. You want to, no, no guarantees of, of optimality. So there's another question, Alejandro, from Lin-Lin. Alejandro. Oh, from Alex, too. Yeah. Um, you, hear, you hear me? Uh, barely, I'm so sorry. Yeah, like my, my, um, my uh, I don't know why my speaker is not. now? A little better, yeah. Okay, um, yeah. So, so in your optimization problem, do you always have to assume that the dielectric function is a local function or can it also be non-local? That's a very good question. So um, we are working right now, as a matter of fact, the, the convergence properties of when you do structural optimization get better if you assume you have a non-local 
uh, permittivity for a number of reasons. And it's one of the reasons we're sort of exploring this. Um, I know there are sort of physical reasons why you might want to as well, but um, sort of we started sort of going down this path because of sort of numerical uh, uh, issues. And so, yes, you can, you can. Um, All right, so um, I'm going to sort of pick on a few problems to just convey what's behind these uh, limits or what, what sorts of things they can tell you. And so a canonical problem that, you know, every student, you know, taking quantum mechanics will know about this, uh, you know, scattering cross-section, right? And so uh, the question of maximizing scattering cross-section is simple. I have a, a region where I have some potential or some, some structure, and I want to maximize either the absorbed power or the scattered power uh, of, you know, from some incident wave, right? And so you want, you, you have the absorption cross-section or you have the scattering cross-section. That's, that's sort of an important figure of merit. And there's tons of applications in, in optics uh, from particle obscurance, cloaking to, to light trapping, where this is sort of the figure of merit that you're, you're interested in, either maximizing or minimizing this quantity. Um, and so I'll give you examples of, of uh, situations where we can put limits on the scattering cross-section. And you know, uh, for instance, uh, a, a also well-known um, set of asymptotics relating to absorption cross-sections are, are sort of traditional black body limits, right? So the, the, in, in the limit of ray optics or geometric optics, where the object sizes are much bigger than the wavelength of light, you know, the iconal approximation is valid. It's known that the sort of the, the scattering cross-section or the absorption cross-section divided by the area um, which is also known as the absorptivity of, of an object, has to be bounded by one. Okay, so this is sort of the, the familiar black body limit, right? When you integrate that out, you get the sort of black body uh, formula. And I'll refer to this again later on. Um, but again, this, this, all of that assumes ray optics, right? If you go to the other uh, extreme regime where the wavelength of, the, of, of light or the typical wavelength of light is much bigger than the size of the object, then you're sort of in the regime of antenna physics and, and sort of circuit physics. Um, me metallic nanoparticles, for instance, are known to yield um, absorptivities, right? Scattering or absorption cross sections much bigger than the area, right? It's they scale, not like the area, but for instance, like the volume. Um, this is sort of a, a typical Rayleigh scattering regime. Um, but uh, it turns out until very recently, we didn't know how much, you know, there were no, no strict upper bounds on how large these, these absorption cross-sections can be. Um, and then more generally, you can ask, well, what if you're in the regime of wave optics, right? The Fourier optics, where the wavelength is on the order of the size of the objects, then there are much more complicated effects at play. And so the, the question we want to ask, well, how do we put limits on these, on these cross-sections given knowledge, right, about the materials that we're playing with? Uh, so the susceptibility or the, the maximum potential in a system. Uh, and that incorporate all kinds of potential wave effects. There are so many different kinds of principles that could be at play, right? Uh, you can have band gaps, you can have quasi-periodic uh, confinement. There, there's all kinds of different effects that must be incorporated in these asymptotics. Um, so uh, just to sort of give you, the, you know, uh, a uh, well-defined uh, question, sort of the goal uh, we set out to, to solve is we want general scattering bounds that, that apply to arbitrary settings, not just small or large domains, but that incorporate <laughs> some notion of the size of the device you're interested in. So some, some bounding surface, right, in which I'm going to uh, confine my device, some material constraint, what is the susceptibility, um, and, the, and all of the, the relevant wave physics. And so here's two examples of, of two different topologies where you might want to sort of constrain the uh, scattering asymptotics, right? Uh, Objects circumscribed by a ball, uh, objects circ circumscribed to be within some slab. Uh, okay, so some some technical uh, technical things now. So just again to remind you of the basic scattering physics we're dealing with. Um, you know, Maxwell's equations we can write down as we did before in differential form, but as it turns out, um, for a number of reasons, it's actually much easier when you're dealing with, with scattering physics to, to write them out, especially the kinds of the things we're gonna be doing in integral form. And so the, the typical scattering problem again, is you have an incident field, some scattering potential, and you want to find out what the scattered field is or the total field, which is the sum of the incident and the scattered field. Um, and in the in, in integral form, 
the total field is basically a sum of the, the incident field and the scattered field is given by the action of a scattering operator. Um, so G0 here, I'm gonna denote as the sort of vacuum Green's function. So the propagator in free space. So I have a, a dipole source and, I'm, and, and, I, and this is basically just a field radiated by the dipole source. Um, and T, uh, it, it's, it's called the T operator, is a linear response uh, scattering operator relating incident fields. So if I give you the incident field, the T operator, the scattering operator outputs the induced polarization currents in the scatterer. Okay, so the induced polarization currents um, or the bound polarization currents. Uh, and given these bound polarization currents, the Green's function acting on these bound polarization currents tells me what the scattered field is, right? The radiated field due to these uh, bound currents. So everything relating to Baxter's equation is really encoded in this T operator, right? Um, you know, there are many different representations of this T operator. The Lippmann Schwinger representation of the T operator is basically a perturbative expansion of this, uh, of this operator, which encodes the potential and the propagating uh, physics of the of, of fields. Um, so basically, T operator is just another way to write an integral form of, of the differential form of Maxwell's equations. So, uh, so the key, what's the key idea behind, behind our limits? Uh, again, if you go back to the, the uh, problem of doing structural optimization, one way to, to potentially frame the problem is to say, look, I want to maximize a, an objective function with respect to these bound polarization degrees of freedom, which again, map to the, the actual structure of the potential in the system. Um, and so you could solve, you know, maximize F um, with respect to every possible bound polarization current you can have in the system, subject to the constraint that the bound polarization current and the incident field in the problem are related via the T operator, okay? So this, bas this basically is just a restatement of that problem because this is a, just a statement of Maxwell's equation, so an integral form of Maxwell's equation. But of course, if you do that, you don't get anything, right? You're just basically solving the original structural optimization problem. So the key idea, and it took us a few years to realize this very simple idea, okay? It's re really coming at the problem from, from uh, a completely different point of view, but it's just to consider a relaxation of this, of this problem. So to relax the, the relationship between the bound current and the incident field that created it. Um, so instead to reduce the full scattering relation to a finite set of constraints by, by taking inner products of this uh, integral relation with some uh, testing functions, right? It, much like you would do in a Galerkin discretization, um, but picking the, the uh, testing function to be the, a projection of the polar, the very bound polarization currents themselves over some domain. And we'll see why you, you want to do that. Um, so if you do this, so you take the sort of the inner product of the integral relation with respect to the polarization currents, you get basically a complex number, right? Um, integrated over, of course, it's just the integral of this uh, over that domain. And this particular relation here, so th these integral relations actually have a very um, intuitive physical meaning, okay? So in particular, uh, and by the way, I've written here explicitly uh, the, you know, T inverse, uh, the, the, the explicit relationship between the T operator and the vacuum Green's function and the susceptibility. Um, so the imaginary part of this complex relation has a very uh, intuitive uh, meaning. This is basically Poynting's theorem. Okay, what you know as uh, you might recall as Poynting's theorem, which is basically a, a conservation of resistive power. So in particular, taking the imaginary part of this uh, of this uh, relation on the left hand side, this looks basically like an integral of the current uh, dotted with the incident field over that. Uh, volume, which is, is basically just the extracted power due to that, that current. And on the right-hand side, you have these two quantities, basically, which you know I'm not going to go into too much detail, but you can just interpret these quantities as the power absorbed in the, in the medium and the power radiated, uh, or you know, basically that you're losing to radiation um, outside of the domain. So this is basically just a conservation of power or Poynting's theorem that is just telling you whatever extracted power you're getting from the source has to go either into absorption, material dissipation, or into radiation. Okay, so one of the two. Um, so this is kind of neat, right? Just by, by 
taking this projection, you're basically writing down some, some kind of Poynting's theorem. And if you take the real part, you also get another conservation uh, principle, one that actually I was far less familiar with when, when we started working on this, which is the conservation of reactive power. So the real part of this, the, the real analog of this expression is basically a kind of um, uh, power conservation, but, but relating to energy stored in the non-radiative parts of the field. So there's actually a bit of a, uh, difficulty in, in sort of precisely interpreting this, this reactive power conservation. You see it a lot in, in sort of antenna uh, physics, but not so much sort of in, when you talk about wave physics. Um, certainly, you know, we, look, we looked around, for instance, in uh, Jackson and a number, a number of other sort of standard ENM books, and, and you I barely uh, found anything about it. Uh, but it's actually, as you'll see, a very important, another important uh, uh, conservation. And so this basically is just a generalized, a complex version, a generalization of Poynting's theorem. And so in, the, in this language, so once you take, you relax the physics to these, these sets of numbers, you can see basically that what we're doing is we're, we're solving a quadratic pro, uh, program, a quadratic uh, optimization problem with a set of quadratic constraints, because these are, again, sesquilinear relations. So quadratic constraints relating to the conservation of energy. Uh, either re resistive energy or reactive energy. And basically the dependence of the, of the susceptibility, the precise structuring in the system can be completely relaxed uh, because basically J and chi have, uh, live in the same, exactly the same domain. So the very optimization degrees of freedom that you're, uh, the, the, the structural degrees of freedom that you're optimizing over basically embed information about the, the structure. Um, but you're relaxing uh, the problem, because now you're not imposing right that full granularity of Maxwell's equations, but some some broader right um, conservation relating to the wave physics, um, and so this is a quadratic uh, program with quadratic constraints, and there are many ways of uh, of solving these kinds of of problems. Um, for example, uh, you can apply Lagrange dual uh, techniques, uh, which is precisely what we did, um, and then there are questions about the degree to which these uh, dual Lagrange methods are, are, uh, can be solved uh, or shown to, to yield to you know, strong duality and so forth. I can talk a little bit more about uh, what we're finding. In there. But uh, anyway, I'll, I'll just skip the sort of the technicalities of how to solve this thing. Can, they can be solved. Um, and I'll just show you some examples of, of what you get when you solve it. Um, I will mention, you know, the, this, this sort of perspective, you know, of... Uh, the, these kinds of uh, perspective, these projections, right? You are allowed to basically take any projection operator here, meaning you're allowed to project these integral relations over any domain without your, within your design uh, domain. Really reminds you of a, of a, a same kinds of techniques that you see in mean field cluster theory. So in particular, you're solving a quadratic program with, with a set of projected integral relations or integral constraints. Um, which you get to define right within your computational cell. So, for instance, you can take this this projection operator to be the, the entirety right of your of your design domain. In which case, you're basically just taking sort of a mean field right zeroth order mean field average of Maxwell's equation right uh, over the entire domain. You're just enforcing that that net global power conservation be satisfied uh, without saying anything particular about what's happening you know inside. Uh, you know, or whether that respects Maxwell's equations. Uh, but you can imagine sort of a hierarchy, right, of, of these uh, projections, right, of these conservation constraints where you, you have many of these projections uh, going from uh, very uh, 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 sort of coarse to more and more granular um, localized uh, integral relations. And uh, this is what I meant at the beginning of the of the talk as a, as a complement to inverse design, because you can imagine that these bounds, if you start with a very coarse characterization, just net global power conservations will be loose. Um, but as you start enforcing that, uh, the integral equations be you know, increasingly satisfied at, at smaller and smaller scales. So you have this multi-scale uh, constraint, uh, set of constraints, the bounds will get tighter and tighter much like in inverse design, as you start giving more structural degrees of freedom to your optimization, you get better and better performance. And so one of the, um, one of the sort of 
mathematical questions you can ask here is well can you guarantee that in the limit as, as you have sort of uh, finer and finer discretizations you know uh, as you have pixel level um, constraints uh, does can you guarantee that you get a tight bound that uh, basically can you co close the potential performance gap between structural optimization and these limits um, and it is a sort of an open question so we have some some uh, ideas uh, it turns out it's equivalent to, to showing that if you're tackling these QCQP problems using dual Lagrange methods that that you get strong duality um, and it's maybe not surprising but it's, it, it's, it's certainly a, a challenge to be to, to show something like this um, are there any questions? I think somebody raised their hand. There is a I, question from the virtual audience. Please. Yes, Alejandro, can, can you hear me? Yes, yes, perfect. Are, are there any fundamental limits on the um, size of your pixelation? Uh, you know, we're not at the quantum scale, but what... Are there any sort of electrodynamic limits on the the, yes. the the fine scale structure of your pixelation? Yeah. yeah, absolutely, right. Like I think this is what Lin, Lin was was talking about, right? Like at some point, your description of the permittivity, right, the local response functions, the material response functions are, are going to fail. So you start getting, you know, uh, electrons, uh, elect nonlinear electron uh, diffusion, and, and uh, you know. Um, uh, basically higher order uh, effects, you know, quantum effects that are not described by sort of just a linear response. Even, even a sort of a nonlinear response will fail. Um, and so you need, for example, non-local uh, susceptibilities to be able to capture some aspects of these quantum effects. Um, and so you can incorporate these into the same framework, right, into a, a, a PDE uh, framework. But at some point, even those things will fail, right? And you have to sort of consider then the, the full optoelectronic problem, right? Or you, or you have some kind of quantum mechanical description of the of the material directly coupled to the wave equations, and, and then that's you can still write that the the resulting problem as a sort of set of coupled uh, uh, PDEs, but things get a lot more complicated. The scale at which this happened will depend on the material, right? Like um, in some materials, you know, the Fermi length scale is relevant. Uh, uh, so that depending on whether you have metals or dielectrics, you, you start to see quantum effects at different, uh, different scales. But, and, and you could argue, well, that, that sets a limit to the, the discretization that I'm willing to consider. Um, because beyond that, then this becomes an, an ad hoc, right? Approximation, Maxwell's equations are then a heuristic. Um, does that answer the question? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, no problem. Okay, very good. Any other questions at the moment? Then let's just move on. Okay. Okay, so let me go through a few examples and I'm gonna ask you, forgive me for if I'm being uh, if if I'm being too glib, uh, but certainly ask questions. Um, so the first example is again one that sort of motivated motivated a lot of our work uh, in this in this area. Uh, we're really interested in sort of understanding limits on thermal radiation. So black, it, it, it's going from black body limits all the way down to quasi statics. So the, the thermal radiation properties of, of sub wavelength objects. And so the first thing we did was, well, let's try a, to apply this, this kind of technique to um, this problem where, you know, we just use the zeroth order conservation of power, sort of enforcing only global power conservation. Um, as a constraint and only resistive power. Uh, you know, when we started working on this, we weren't even aware that, that reactive power was, was uh, something to, to consider. Um, but, you know, just, just doing a very, very simple um, quadratic program where you're just optimizing thermal radiation, which is the same thing as optimizing angle integrated absorption over, some, over the domain, and just enforcing that global power conservation, resistive power conservation hold. Uh, is enough to give you actually some pretty interesting results. So first of all, um, you see in the asymptotics that there's an important figure of merit, which I'm going to denote as zeta. Um, and this is a, a figure of merit that only depends on the susceptibility. And you can think of it as a, as a, as a conductivity, right? As an, uh, 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 it scales like the susceptibility over the imaginary part of the susceptibility, which is the dissipation. And so as the as the dissipation goes to zero, 
then zeta <laughs> diverges, whereas the susceptibility or the index of refraction gets bigger. You have a larger material response. Um, and so what you see here are the, so th these lines are all asymptotic, so the, the result of doing this. And there, you can you can solve this problem, it turns out, analytically. Um, so you get very smooth, nice looking uh, bounds. And so what I'm plotting here in the y-axis is the absorptivity or the, the radiation per unit area. And on the x-axis is the size of my domain. And so remember, these are limits. We're not saying anything about what kinds of structures uh, yield this kind of performance. We're just saying this is the best performance you can get. Um, and uh, what you see is, well, first of all, all these lines in the limit of, of large domains asymptote to the black body formula, which is the dashed line here. Absorptivity has to be bounded by one. Um, but uh, it, you know, as you <laughs> go to the very, very small domains, the, all of these lines actually scale linearly on this plot, which means the absorptivity scales or the, sorry, the, the emission or the absorption scales like the volume. So, you, so it's capturing the physics of you know, ray optics or geometric optics. It's also capturing the sort of intuitive physics related to Rayleigh scattering and everything in between. And um, not surprisingly, <coughs> the absorptivity or thermal radiation can be much bigger than, than the black body limits suggest if you're somewhere in between. Um, and you can actually say things about the asymptotics of uh, this, in, uh, you know, how these uh, limits depend, for example, on this material uh, figure of merit, they scale logarithmically with, with zeta. Um, so, you know, at this level, this is actually quite neat to see that, that just a simple global resistive power conservation gives you so much sort of intuitive physics. Um, but this figure of, of merit, there's still something missing here. This figure of merit doesn't distinguish, for instance, between different kinds of materials. Um, so it, this, this uh, it only depends on chi, uh, chi square, absolute value of chi squared over the imaginary part of chi. Uh, whereas we know in, in the NM, metals and dielectrics behave very, very differently. Um, for instance, you might ask, well, how is it possible to get very, very large absorptivities down here, but very, very small? You know, this is a highly sub-wavelength domain. If you have something like a dielectric particle, where you don't have electronic resonances uh, in the system, there's no way to get a, a, a resonance. Um, and, you know, you couldn't, you wouldn't be able to do that. But this kind of asymptotic does not make a distinction between something like what you get with a metal versus that dielectric. And, and the reason is we're not incorporating um, reactive power conservation also uh, into the, the optimization. And so just to give you an example of what you get when you, do, when you impose reactive and resistive power, I'm going to switch to, to the problem of maximizing scattering cross-section, which is also related. Um, just the radiated uh, scattered power from an incident wave. But instead of maximizing just with respect to resistive power, I'm going to maximize with respect to reactive power. And just to sort of uh, <coughs> give you sort of the, the high level perspective on what the distinction between these two kinds of power conservations is, um, it turns out resistive power conservation sets a bound on the magnitude of the maximum response, the uh, electromagnetic response or bound polarization you can get in the system. Whereas reactive power conservation, Tells you something about the relative phase which you can with a which with which a structure can impart on the wave. Um, so it's very very relevant and critical to localization and near field effects to the ability to get resonances in a system. Um, and so this is something that wasn't really clear to us, you know, from the beginning. But as you'll see from these results, I'll, I'll talk about now, they are uh, highly highly important. So um, both of these plots on the left and on the right. Um, yield uh, are describing upper bounds on the scattering cross-section just under global power conservation. So again, the only thing we're enforcing is that this quadratic uh, function, which is the scattered power from this domain, um, be maximized subject to the constraint that energy be conserved throughout the domain. So we're not saying really anything about what's, what's happening within the domain and, or how that should relate to Maxwell's equation. And sort of on the left, we have the bounds for metals, for a particular metal, a real part of the susceptibility is negative. So this is like in quantum mechanics, it's like having a negative potential. Um, and then on the right-hand side here, <laughs> we have a dielectric. Okay, well, real part of chi is, is 16. This is like germanium. And um, 
you can see a very significant difference between the so the dashed line in both of these curves are what you get the the limits you get when you have just conservation of resistive power whereas the solid lines are are the results when you incorporate resistive and reactive power conservation so clearly the additional constraint in all of these cases is lowering or tightening the bounds but in the case of a dielectric especially when you have sub when you have sub wavelength domains this tightening is orders and orders of magnitude different from what you get when you have metals um, and by the way all of these curves are limits considering different values of the dissipation in the system okay of the of the uh, uh, material loss but in all cases so if you, you maybe start with the metals you see the same kind of Rayleigh scattering uh, uh, <coughs> regime where the scattering cross-section scales like the volume not the area um, it grows up to, up to some point and then basically it saturates and it asymptotes back to the sort of geometric cross-section uh, limit. The same is true for dielectrics, but you can see that the imposition of, of uh, reactive power conservation takes you from something that, that looks a lot like what you see with metals down to much significantly lower scattering cross-sections. And that's very simple to explain. It's again, resistive power conservation is saying something about the ability of a material to create resonances. Uh, well, the combination of material and wave interference. And for a dielectric, if you're in the sub-wavelength volume, there's no way to get a, a resonance out of the system. You need to have half-wavelength condition effectively to, to be satisfied. And precisely, you see that the limits basically spike up. There's a very sharp transition in the, the magnitude of the scattering cross-sections you can get with a dielectric as you start getting to wavelength scale uh, regimes. Whereas for a metal, you can, you can get large scattering cross-sections even in the sub-wavelength regime. And limited, of course, by dissipation. So the, the, the smaller the dissipation, the larger the scattering cross-section. That's true for, for dielectrics too. Um, so this is really giving you the full picture, right? And, and it's actually very, very surprising if you ask the question, well, how tight are these limits? Um, it, what you find, if you look at the, so the solid lines here are results of applying structural optimization to the problem. So we're actually taking whatever material this is, real part of pi is minus 10 and 16, and then structuring the, the, the medium, right? Subject to the constraint that it has to sort of be within the domain of radius R. Um, and sort of we're plotting the results of the structural optimization. If you don't do structural optimization, by the way, these dots would be all the way down here, right? So very, very low uh, scattering cross section. So you do need the nano structuring to be able to, to get large scattering cross sections. But the, the sort of surprising fact is that the limit, the, these dots, so the green lines uh, go with the green dots, are coming within factors of unity of the limits. Uh, the same is true in the case of dielectrics. Uh, you, you can see some, some uh, examples, you know, cross sections of, the, of the, what the structures look like. Uh, these dielectric dots are coming very, very, very close to the limits. It's very surprising, right? Because all you're doing with, with uh, these limits is basically, you have a quadratic, pro, uh, quadratic um, objective with two constraints, and it's just global, global energy uh, conservation. So there's very, very little information about Maxwell's equations there, except if just, just a, this sort of a mean field. Um, the courses kind of um, integral relation you can get from uh, from Maxwell's equation, but surprisingly you get a lot of a lot of uh, uh, interesting physics and nearly tight um, results. I think there was another uh, another uh, question. Yes, um, I was just wondering how computationally expensive these kinds of uh, simulations are. Yeah, so good question. So the structural optimization um, calculations are 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 can be pretty expensive, especially when you get down, you know, out here, right? You see that we don't have too many dots out here. And so you, as your devices get much bigger, right, than the wavelength, then basically you, you have to apply iterative methods because dense solvers basically are just too slow. And, and uh, you know, iterative, there aren't actually very many good iterative solvers. Uh, Maxwell solvers, you'd be surprised, right? This is such an old problem, but there aren't many good iterative solvers when you get down to, to large structures, uh, especially when you're using, you know, sur surface integral equation methods or volume integral equation methods. Um, and so they do get very expensive. Um, you know, we can compute 
things out here using uh, supercomputers and so forth. Um, it turns out the limit calculations are not nearly as, as, uh, as expensive. Well, again, here you're just basically solving a quadratic program with these two uh, global constraints. It turns out you can solve that almost analytically. Um, so you get, you get these solid lines effectively um, semi-analytically, uh, not expensive at all. Um, of course, uh, I hope I answered your question. Yes. Um, okay. yeah. Yeah. Of course, then you could ask, well, what happens? How much, how tighter can I get if I now don't do just global power conservation, but I start now enforcing energy conservation at smaller and smaller scales, you know, localized power conservation constraints. I have not, not, not two, but potentially, you know, hundreds, even thousands of, of constraints and things get then more expensive. Um, <coughs> and you can see here, for instance, <coughs> focusing on this region, the dielectric results of the, you know, in the transition between sub wavelength to uh, <coughs> wavelength scale, you can see the global power conservation constraints are in lighter um, colors. And once you impose eight, so in this case, we just chose eight concentric shells as the sort of sub regions to where you're enforcing the integral relations, um, you can see that the limits are getting tighter, right? Um, not that tight. It turns out you need to, you needed to break symmetry here uh, in order to get better uh, better results. This is these were sort of older results, a uh, year and a half, almost two years old now. But uh, you know they get better. Uh, however, you know of course it gets it gets more expensive. <coughs> See how much time I have. I have just a few minutes, which is just uh, what I need. Um, just the last example. I, I just. I find these these the ability to do these uh, uh, limits now and all these different kinds of problems kind of exciting. So uh, and I especially like this problem. So it's related to, to the problem of thermal radiation. Um, but you know an example where sort of these black body limits fail is is if you consider you have a hot object and you have a near uh, an object nearby, sort of in the vicinity of the object. Even if the objects are much bigger than the than the wavelength or the thermal wavelength, um, if the separation between the two objects is, is sub wavelength. Then the block, body, you know, ray optics fails, black body limits fail, and so the one question we had is, well, how did you, how could, what are the modifications to this uh, t to the fourth uh, power law in 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 situations like this? Um, you know, even even engineering um, the absorption properties of a of a large object where these uh, <laughs> block black body limits um, are valid isn't trivial. So the black body limit tells you nothing about how your material, how difficult it is based on your material to engineer perfect absorption, right? A perfect black body. Um, so it, it really says nothing about how material enters into this. And, and there's a lot of work in, in the NM to try to engineer structures that are, that are nearly perfect absorbers through sort of the solar spectrum, you know, for solar cell applications and so forth. Um, but in addition to not incorporating this black body limits at, its, at their core, what they're missing is the fact that, you know, they're only, if you're looking purely at propagating waves, you're only looking at the electromagnetic fields radiated by the thermal currents, right? That are giving rise to the thermal emission that scale like one over R, right? So the radiative part, you're not incorporating the non-radiative or the near field parts, parts which can transfer energy. They can tunnel, right? These waves can tunnel through, even though they're evanescent. Um, and so this is a sort of a problem that we've been interested in for a while. Um, there's really, until recently, there wasn't an understanding of like how these near field or evanescent waves would contribute because they can be changed significantly through nanostructuring. Um, here's an example of an experiment where they take a little tip, um, the heat of a substrate, and they take a little tip and they compute the, heat, the radiative uh, energy transfer, the heat transfer between the two, and they get you know, heat transfer rates that are, you know, millions of times larger than the black body limits would, would suggest. But again, there was no understanding of, of how that happened. So we applied this, these kinds of techniques. Um, and, you know, again, what's really surprising is that they actually give you, you know, semi-analytical and analytical insight. So here's, a, here's a, what we found here. There's a modification to the black body uh, formula that incorporates the distance between the two objects. Again, the only thing you have to assume is basically there's a separating plane between the hot object and the cold object. Um, and so this sets the, uh, the domain, right? The, the, the um, scale of the object cell can also enter into the, 
into the uh, limit, but you can show that it scales like one over d squared, and you can show that there's a dependence also on the material, um, which for a number of reasons, uh, you know, we were really happy to see this logarithmic dependence on the susceptibility, this scaling. Um, we were able to show that existing structures can achieve these modified bounds and precisely what kinds of structures can do that, um, which is sort of really uh, kind of a neat result. We've applied the, the, the same kinds of techniques to, to compute limits on Casimir forces, you know, Casimir polder forces, quantum, quantum uh, forces arising from, from quantum fluctuations. Um, and for example, we were able to show that there's a, you have a pretty large potential for levitating objects using just uh, Casimir, basically nanostructuring uh, objects and using the Casimir, uh, Casimir force. Um, and then, you know, more broadly, really, you can apply these techniques to, to study all kinds of, of uh, limits. You're familiar, for instance, with the diffraction limits, which effectually, effectually fail when you have uh, sub-wavelength systems. Um, you, can, you can study limits on optical communication. Any kind of wave transformation you might be interested in is, is a fair game. And we have some new examples recently um, that, that are really quite promising. So anyway, just to, to, um, to finish up, so the main, main, uh, main takeaways of, of this talk, hopefully, um, is uh, number one, structural optimization is, is a promising bottom-up approach to doing wave design. But it is a blind search for, for high-performing structures because you have no guarantee of optimality. However, it's very useful. Um, as, you can, as, as you've seen from some of these examples. Um, and what's really neat about these, these uh, QCQP techniques is that your, uh, your field optimization bounds are now offering a top-down approach to assess achievable performance. So uh, it turns out there's no yet no way to guarantee that the bounds are, are tight, even in the limit as you have infinitely uh, infinite discretization. Um, and they don't give you knowledge of the best structures out there. Um, but they do allow you to sort of, they guide you in the sense that they give you, they, they, they uh, tell you something about the gap between the inverse design structures and then the, what's physically admissible. Uh, and as it turns out, you can use the, the optimal bound currents of, this, of the QCQP as a starting point for inverse design. And this is something we're exploring as a way to do, uh, just going back to the question that PK asked, to speed up uh, inverse design calculation. So you, you can start with structures that are potentially closer to the, to the optimal structures. Um, uh, finally, I'll just mention again, because the language we're using is just very general language of, of wave problems, you can apply the same techniques to quantum mechanics, uh, microfluidics, any, any kind of wave problem that you might be interested in. And we're actually uh, working right now, showing that you can also apply it to nonlinear problems, so not, not only uh, linear problems, but any nonlinear problem that can be broken down into a set of quadratic linear problems. Um, you know, that's fair game. Uh, thank you so much. And, uh, you know, thanks for the questions too. And, and I'm uh, happy to answer more questions if there are any.